Okay, guys, so I have set up here a completely absurd position, right? Where white has four pawns. That's a nice material plus, but there aren't even kings on the board. But we're not interested in the kings being on the board. We're just interested in understanding key squares. So let's take the first pawn, b3, and see what are the key squares. Well, we skip a row and we find this b5 square and then the two adjacent squares. So here, those are the key squares, these three, for this pawn right here. For the pawn on d4, it would be these three. Right? Makes sense. However, the rule book changes once we speak of these pawns here on g5 and b6. And what has changed? Well, the way I find easiest to understand is that here's our half of the board. And this pawn and this pawn as well have both moved beyond our half of the board. And once that happens, we still have our usual key squares, but that in between row that we typically skip, suddenly we don't skip it anymore. So this is very good news for the side that is pushing, trying to make something of his extra pawn. But very, very dangerous fact if you are on the defending side. So it's important to know both as the side with the pawn and the side without, because otherwise you could get into some ridiculous situation, like for example, this one that I'll now set up. Now, you've probably never played this particular chess variant before, and I don't recommend it, but here we are with two kings for each side. What we're trying to explain, however, is the issue of key squares. So here we have a pawn on b3, and we know that we skip a row, and then we have these three key squares. Therefore, the situation on the queen's side with these kings here, if we see the white king can move to say c4, but black will play king to c6. Remember, these are the key squares, and so black's move would just logically hold off the king. And so if white instead goes to a4, black will meet that with king a6. And in any case, whichever move white plays, he won't be able to access the key squares. Of course, if it's black to move, it's a different story altogether. Black would have to either go here, after which white could access one of the key squares, or go to a6, and same concept. So, therefore, in this position, it's a draw if it's white to move, and it's a loss for black if it's black to move, because in that case, white would have the opposition, and he can use the opposition to access a key square. Now, Let's flip the board just to see it more clearly. So if you're on the defensive side, the situation here is absolutely fine for you as long as it's your opponent's move. On the other hand, if you're on the defensive side here, then it doesn't matter if it's your move or if it's your opponent's move because here we have all of the key squares. We have that extra row think about it, we're picturing it from the other side. That's a little bit tricky, right? But, you know, from a kind of a different angle. But here are the traditional three key squares, right? Skip a row, and then the square immediately in front, and the square in front of the pawn on the same file, and then the two adjacent squares. However, because the pawn is now a fifth rank pawn, it's crossed over and we have six key squares rather than just three, as in this example. Because in this case, we're speaking of a third rank pawn. So therefore, here it doesn't matter who it is to move. As an example, if the king moves to h6, then black can take the opposition with king h8, but now pawn will move to g6. The king must step back to g8, and the pawn move g7 will force the king to play king f7. Hopefully you've been able to visualize that, but let's see it play out over the board now. I'm going to delete this part of the board and we will see what happens. <laughs> 
So now it is white to move and he can play the move king to h6. And now black can try and sort of take the opposition. And remember, if we're making the mistake of thinking it's only one row of key squares, then everything is under control. But in fact, it's that second row. So white is already on a key square. And therefore, after g6, king to g8, the whole point is g7 forces the black king to move. And now king to h7 and the pawn will promote. Let's now return to a situation where the pawn is on the third rank. Now, in this position, as the defending side, we are safe because we are controlling all of these key squares and his pawn has not crossed over into our half of the board, unlike in the previous example. So now, if it's black to move, we would be in trouble because if we go here, as seen, he would go onto a key square. If we go here, he would step onto a different key square. However, if it's white to move and he plays, let's say, move like king to c4, we take the opposition. We are preventing access to those key squares. Now, if he returns to b4, once again, what's his threat in terms of key squares? King to a5. So we stop that. King goes to a4. Well, once again, these are the two that he can potentially access. Therefore, any of these moves would be big mistakes. This move as well. So therefore, king a6 is the only square from which we can control the key squares. Sooner or later, he can give this up because if he pushes back, we can simply continue to take the opposition. If he pushes back further, we can continue like this. If king over, we can go either here, here, or here, in fact, but king b5 behind the pawn is good. King c3, king c5. So eventually he will push. King here, king here, king here. And we've already seen this. This is simply a very straightforward draw, because in this case, it's white to play, and he must either stalemate us or lose the pawn. So we see that it's quite clear if it's a fifth pawn, or indeed a sixth ranked pawn, the way that I explain it is just if the pawn is on his half of the board, there's only one row of key squares, only three key squares to watch out for. However, if the pawn is on the fifth rank or further, you may have to contend with two rows of key squares. So keep that in mind from both sides' perspectives. Okay, so that is it as far as the rules of key squares go, with one final sort of change of the rules applying to one very special kind of pawn and most of you i'm sure will know this already and that is that the rook pawns have a totally different set of rules so let's check out the rules for the rook pawns where are the key squares for rook's pawn so here we are and white has a rook's pawn and as you can see it's not even legal for it to be the same three squares, this kind of T-shape. Because here we have this square, this square, but you know there's no file to the left of the A file, right? If you know what I mean. So the question is, are these the key squares? Will placing the king on one of those squares, will that assure white victory? Well, in fact, that is not the case. Let's imagine king goes to B3, king goes to D6, King goes here and now king sees him. I can happily let you take one of these squares and after you take it I can go king to b7 and still here you can advance but eventually what's going to happen is I'm going to stick around in this sort of corner region and sure you can push me back to one of these squares and now king here of course Stepping away from the corner would be a fatal mistake. He would push. That would control the b8 square. And then on the next move, the pawn would advance. However, king to a8, simple draw. If a7, it's stalemate. And there is nothing else. I mean, if king c7, for example, well, king a7 and the pawn will fall. And if king a5 or king b5, it's just back to regular business right? 
we can just repeat like this indefinitely. So therefore, it's not about controlling the b5 or the a5 squares. So is it about the next row? Well, once again, if we picture a king here or a king here, he could just get his king into the corner. So I guess it's about controlling some kind of corner square. But is it controlling these squares? Well, let's take a look. King here, king here, king here, king here, king over, king a6. Now we were talking about these two squares, king here and king a7. Well, in this case, black will go king c8. Now, white already has one of these squares, so he pushes. Black will go c7, push again. Here, push again, king c7, king a8, king c8. And now a7, king c7, and we got ourselves another stalemate. So clearly those are not the key squares. So what are the key squares? Well, it turns out that there are two, b7 and b8. Now, in any of these squares, the white king is far enough away from the file that black cannot use this kind of jail cell, right, that we saw right here to stalemate the white king. And on the other hand, the king on b7 or b8 will very readily support the pawn. So now, in this case, if black right now does not prevent white from accessing one of the key squares, then it will be game over. Unless, of course, the pawn can be captured. So for instance, right here, king goes to c5. And now if a4, king to b4, and the pawn will be captured. This is always something we got to keep in mind. A key square is no good if we're losing our pawn. However, if instead, in this position, white now played the move pawn to a4, then he would win. Because if king to d7, the black king wants access to the b7 square. Because remember, these are the two key squares. So from c8, the black king would prevent the white king from going to either of the key squares. But now white plays king b7. King wherever, a5, it's game over. If king d6, a5 anyway, king c5, a6, king b5, a7, the pawn cannot be caught. So that is an important bit of attention to detail, right? We have to be precise exactly with the order that we go. If we here in this position played king to b7, that would be a huge mistake. 